Thank you very much, Tarek. Really appreciate it and great to be here at Super Return Middle East. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel session. Um, my name is Hatuna Prokrovska, <laughs> uh, Senior Manager at ESG Business Development at SMB Global Sustainable One. It's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion, ESG on the Rise, Sustainability Success Strategy at the Super Return Middle East um, virtual conference this year, helping corporates and investors keep pace with the evolving ESG narrative in the Middle East, as well as sustainable growth across the global value chain. It is impossible not to make note of the fact that today's conference also coincides with the, with the COP26 in Glasgow. The urgency of addressing climate change has driven investors to put sustainability and environmental, social, and governance practices at the heart of their business strategies. Both regulators and government authorities have also started a series of nationwide sustainability initiatives aimed at reversing the consequences of climate change and have called on institutions to act as champions. We recognize that today's topic is of great interest to you. We want this to be an interactive session and encourage you to submit your questions for discussion. It is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists, Abhishek Sharma, founder, chief executive officer of Foundation Holdings. Welcome, Abhishek. Nesreen Sruji, CEO of Amundi uh, Asset Management, Middle East. Rasha Al Kawaja, Director at TPL RMC Limited. Hello, Rasha. Hello, Nesreen. Welcome. And mm -hmm. Adam Black, Partner, Head of ESG and Sustainability at Caller Capital. Thank you all for joining us and let's get started. Um, what would make an investment sustainable today? Um, shall we start with you, Ms. Reen? Um, sure. I mean, that, that's a, that's a, a big uh, question. So let me just start by saying that um, for, for those who don't know or not familiar with Amundi, we're one of the largest asset managers in the world. Um, we manage over $2 trillion in AUM. Um, and we're also one of the pioneers of responsible investment. And when I say irresponsible investment, I'm using it interchangeably with ESG. So we manage over 700 billion um, in responsible investment AUM. Uh, and and ha in terms of what qualifies as a sustainable investment, I think that's really been an evolution over the years. Um, uh, initially, when we talked about ESG, for example, um, we talked about exclusions. So excluding certain sectors from uh, an, an investor's uh, remit, um, then that kind of moved into best in class, which really focused more on high ESG ratings, um, which was effective. And now the movement really is more towards engagement and impact. Um, impact investing has really become um, the new normal. Um, so, and when, when, when we say what really makes it uh, a sustainable investment, um, you know, in terms of the factors of ESG or responsible investment, climate change is still really leading the pack, um, but social in inequality um, is on the rise. Uh, this trend was really reinforced by COVID. I think that really came through in terms of people's focus on healthcare, education. You know, you saw Black Lives Matters movement, all of that. Um, that's really all linked to, to uh, social inequality. And that is inextricably linked with climate change. Um, so we focus a lot on the just transition at Amundi and making sure that when we talk about climate change or other factors, um, that you know the interests of ordinary people are at the heart of that and no one is left behind. So a long answer to just saying that um, uh, when we say sustainable investments, we're talking about we're, we're including climate change, we're including so social inequality more and more, and of course, governance, uh, which has always been important. Thank you very much for that, Nasreen. Um, Adam, I'd like to have you weigh in on that uh, as well. What makes an investment sustainable today? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think, well, that's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, for me, as an environmental scientist by background, I always go back to 
one of the original definitions, um, 1987 in the Brundtland Report, our common future. And that said, it's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's kind of easy said, difficult to do. I think after decades working in industry and in the finance sector, seeing lots of different types of industries. For me, I use environmental, social and governance issues almost as stepping stones to help you get to a more sustainable business model. And for me, for any business, that means it has to be financially successful, but at the same time, actively managing and addressing and mitigating its environmental and social issues. So there's a sort of balance, a harmony, if you will, between all of those factors. And it is a journey. And I think what's sustainable for some people may not be as sustainable for others. So if I think of, often there's a values based judgment in there as well. So it's it's not black and white often. And I think, you know, if you have a, a food production business um, in a developing region, maybe based on meat, um, that will hit certain impact metrics for certain investors because you're elevating people out of poverty, perhaps. But it might not fit the goals of a vegan investor, for example. So it's there's a lot of calibration and clarity is often required when you talk about sustainable investing. But for me, when I look at a portfolio of assets in the private markets, I think really it's working closely with deal teams to make sure that there's a financially compelling story there, there's value still at play, but that the main E, S and G issues, the material environmental, social and governance factors are well understood and are being thought about in the way they're gonna manage that asset moving forward to mitigate those risks. So you can get this balance between the financial and the ESG factors to get a more sustainable business in the longer term, right? Thank you, Adam. Absolutely. There are different conviction-based approaches to sustainable investing, and um, th there are different ways to capture the ESG. Um, and of course, it all comes down to financial materiality, um, because we are still responsible to our uh, investors, as well as the society and community around us. Um, Abhishek, uh, over to you. What makes a, an investment an investment sustainable in your eyes? Thank you, Atuna. Uh, well, I guess it's an understatement to say that the world has changed in the last 18 months or so. Uh, and obviously, this big COVID or pandemic is really something which has forced all of us to reevaluate and evaluate what's truly important. So it's no surprise that I guess all stakeholders, customers, investors, government, are demanding something more sustainable, socially conscious corporate behavior. And so, you know, for us, at least when we've tried to dig deeper into what's ESG, how does one really work with it? What is truly sustainable investing and uh, responsible behavior? ESG is not about uh, just doing good for good sake. It's really about recognizing what customers and other stakeholders really want and then turning it into a strategy uh, which creates tangible value. Uh, in our case, Akuna, we've studied and looked at, I was just looking at our list, principles for responsible investment to try and understand PRI, what's a baseline. We've looked at the Green Climate Fund standards, IFC performance standards, UN Global Impact, and ultimately what it comes down to, which luckily for us is a four pillar framework, is how does one improve access? How does one improve affordability? How does one improve quality? and strengthen human capital. Those are the four real uh, metrics or call it the benchmark of what qualifies and what is sustainable investing in our eyes. Uh, luckily for us, uh, we're only focused on healthcare and only focused on education. So, you know, these sectors automatically almost lend themselves to sustainable investing. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, my sense. Thank you very much, Abhishek. Russia, can you weigh in on this as well? What makes an investment sustainable in your perspective? Thank you, Hatuna. Um, uh, and, and thanks uh, for a uh, super return to um, uh, have me and the rest of the panel here today. Um, what, uh, I'm a director in TPL, um, REIT management company, and I wanted to just give a brief so that I can 
elaborate a little bit more on the subject. So uh, TPL is a, is a large asset manager uh, and we, we manage funds that um, develop real estate in frontier markets, predominantly in Pakistan. So we, la- we, we, uh, we manage funds that are uh, quite large in size. Our first fund is about $500 million, which is you know, large for frontier markets. And we, uh, we develop uh, sustainable communities. We develop commercial real estate, uh, residential, hospitality, and a small portion of retail. Um, and it's uh, because it's in frontier markets, the, um, the main essence of our um, ethos is to build sustainable uh, uh, real estate. Now, there is a lot that comes into, in, in, into play when we're looking at, uh, at, um, uh, at uh, building sustainable communities. So we have to look at uh, many different facets, given whether we're looking at um, renewable energy, off-grid renewable capabilities, rainwater management, we look at um, solid water management systems. We, um, uh, you know, we focus very much on how we are reducing carbon emission in in the communities that we're building. So when we're uh, planning a community with the master planners, it's very important to um, for us to gauge what uh, what carbon emission will be uh, produced to go from the residential to the commercial, um, so from home to office, etc. And there is a um, uh, you know our um, uh, investors in general are uh, uh, large quasi governments in the U.S. and in Europe, and they're mandated to improve the infrastructure in frontier markets. And part of the mandate is to look very closely at the carbon emission at how is this affecting climate change? Um, uh, where are we uh, in terms of the net zero, etc.? And uh, are we LEED certified? Are we EDGE certified? Um, and these are no longer uh, points of discussion. They're actually requirements. So before we even embark on any project, these certifications need to be there, whether it's a LEED gold or others, in order to be able to even have a, a conversation with the investors. So it's, it's, I think the, as, as you know, it's been said here, it's no long, I mean, the world, the world's moved on quite a, quite a bit in the past um, couple of years, you know, before it was still a conversational and where do you rank in ESG? But when you, when you talk about real estate development in frontier markets, it, it's no longer where do you rank? It's either you, 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 you satisfy all the criteria or you're, you're not, you're not on the map, really. Um, in a way, it's it's. I mean, for us, it's very important. We've we've um, uh, uh, TPL has been in, in property development over a decade, and our previous projects, even before the wave of ESG in the world, were all sustainable. Were all very high end uh, on on the ESG uh, grading, and that's. Um, something that's within the ethos of our company but then it obviously filters on after after uh, the, the the building of the actual real estate because this is a this is a, a fund uh there's an equity component debt component that comes into it and also these are all green so we would look to issue green debt etc so so once you look at the financial um aspect of the fund not not the actual real estate and construction function it also all uh, um, uh, goes on to the high, high high ranking on ESG and and as I said, in frontier markets no longer have the um, luxury to think where do they uh, rank on ESG. It's becoming a, definitely a, a, a prerequisite to be um, high ranking on it. Thank you so very much, Russia. That's um, that's a very interesting perspective and quite important to to note as you bring up. Um, the the real estate aspect. There are so many um, uh, things in development in the Middle East currently. And of course, um, as uh, often happens with frontier markets, um, for a period of time, they might be lagging and then they leapfrog the rest of us um, in terms of strategy and development. Um, uh, An important point on real estate, of course, um, there are um, talks uh, about different governments um, being in projects um, uh, to build sustainable cities. Um, and I think this is really, really exciting, smart cities and sustainable cities coming to our future. Um, 
Uh, Nisreen, what new and exciting opportunities has the decarbonization effort brought to the Middle East in your perspective? And what does it mean for, for the future? So I think um, there's really a tsunami globally on this topic. Uh, as, you, as you started by saying, you know, the COP26 is happening this week. Um, uh, we've just seen uh, in, in Rome yesterday, G20 leaders agree uh, to end international financing of coal power. And it's the first time they pledged to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's never been mentioned in a G20 leaders uh, uh, communique before. Um, Glas in Glasgow COP26 uh, is today, net zero is upon us. I think it's, it's clear that world leaders are recognizing the urgency of this. And that's really been emphasized by the recent uh, IPCC report which really reminded us of, of the scale of the challenge um, of, of climate change. And I think that we're not, I mean, we're not immune to this in the Middle East. Um, Middle East governments are also um, making leaps and bounds and, and, and uh, in, in, in the progress towards this. We see this on a governmental level um, in terms of, you know, being signatories to international uh, agreements on, on climate change. The UAE, for example, is a signatory to the Paris Agreement, as well as a signatory to the United Nations Principles on Responsible Investment. We also see it um, in terms of the way that sovereigns, uh, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the firms that manage, the entities that manage the money of these countries are investing. And without fail, the largest sovereigns in the region have signed up to global commitments. For example, the, the uh, sovereign, the One Planet Summit uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund Working Group, which is an effort led by um, Macron, the, the, the president of, uh, of France, um, to, to take steps in their investments. And this really, you know, when, when you see this, uh, uh, on a, when you see regional governments taking steps towards regulation, and then you see also uh, their movements from a, from an investment perspective. This inevitably trickles down to companies in the region, and it trickles down to investors in the region. And as much as um, you know, a lot of this effort has been in publicly listed companies because that's really been the easiest to track in terms of um, you know ESG ratings, etc. It's also trickling down. In the private equity world. So for those of you who think that, you know, in private equity, you're immune to this, that's not the case. And it might not be a choice anymore as to for you to decide what is sustainable or, or um, what is not. Um, there will be regulations and laws to implement this. So for example, um, uh, CalPERS and the Carlyle Group are leading um, investors, 4 trillion, uh, investors that represent $4 trillion in assets. They're creating a standardized set of ESG metrics um, called the ESG Data Convergence Project. And this will allow general partners to track, gather, and report on ESG data, data from their portfolio companies based on metrics. So it's, it's really uh, uh, going to be a requirement, not only for publicly listed companies, but also for private companies and for the, the, the private equity world. It's, it's really important that investors that gauge this, um, and particularly in this region, because I think ESG and uh, responsible investment generally is, is a huge movement that if, if people ignore, they'll be left behind. In the same way that when technology came, you know, at the time people thought it was only gonna apply to the computer industry. Well, we've seen that's not the case. And I think it's the same with, with ESG now, um, it's going to apply and affect everyone. Um, and everyone needs to take note of it. Um, may I add something? Actually, just of following on, on on what um, uh, Nassine was saying uh, on France, because I mean, we, we talk about sustainability a lot more than we talk about everything else in ESG. So on, I wanted to just bring up a point on governance, because obviously governance is it's always been on the map and et cetera, but diversity in governance has been the, the 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 talk obviously uh recently but france um have just appointed a uh, an ambassador for um gender equality who i was actually um just with a couple of days ago to discuss 
um, uh, gender equality um, metrics that they are taking. But this is the first of its kind in any country. It's the first. Um, uh, this role has just been created in, in France, um, her, her name is Delphine O, um, uh, uh, as an ambassador for gender equality of France. And she um, uh, obviously is involved in how to improve the gender equality in not only in the country, but also um, she's involved uh, internationally in, in the topic. And that's the first time this has happened in any country. And I think we're, we're seeing different uh, movements and, and different, um, uh, you know, movements coming into ensuring that governance is not just another tick the box, which we've, you know, we've seen sustainability was also a tick the box. And now it's it's no longer a tick the box. It's, it's actually this tangible measures that, you know, and um, uh, that companies have to provide for investors. Um, and I think of governance also moving that way. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Russia. Um, I, I'd like to uh, have you um, weigh in on this uh, as well, Adam. Um, what other opportunities are arising from decarbonization efforts in the Middle East? Yeah, thanks, Atina. I think, um, yeah, I'm just going to touch on the private markets piece because um, Nasreen is absolutely right. Like, we're not going to hit the sustainable development goals or any of these net zero ambitions without private equity especially playing a meaningful role um, and it has done for some time I mean I first got into private equity back in 2008 um, the world has changed markedly since then there are very very few private equity firms now that will not have something meaningful to say about sustainability in ESG um, and we're all interconnected I think on a pre-call we talked about this sort of symbiotic relationship we all have like What's going on in Europe, what's going on in Asia, it will, it, all of this will affect every market everywhere, including the Middle East, in terms of what investors are expecting, in terms of how assets are monitoring and disclosing information and thinking about opportunity and not just risk. Um, so I think what you've seen in other geographies will manifest itself in the Middle East in terms of greater transparency and disclosure of information, mitigation of risk but also a much closer focus on what the opportunity is for any business uh, with a sustainability lens overlaid over it. So whether it's a, a direct solution provider, so it's renewables or it's healthcare or it's education, something direct, or wh whatever the asset might be, they'll learn from what other businesses are doing. And that is really looking very closely at the mechanics of how that asset is run, what it does, where it gets its raw materials from, who its customers are, where the, how those are changing over time, and thinking very carefully about the products and services that they provide. Um, yeah, essentially considering in its fullest way the role that ESG can play, not just within the operations of the business, but in terms of its product service and end users and so on. It's not going to be any different to what we've seen in other in other geographies, but there are going to be nuances that particularly around renewables, I would say, I would say, and around water, <laughs> uh, where there are great, there are big opportunities. And those are the things that probably most excite me, I think, over the coming five to 10 years to see what we can see happening in the Middle East around investment in those areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, so let's dig a little deeper. How can ESG be integrated to achieve a balance between environmental, social, and governance uh, practices and uh, financial profit. Um, Abhishek, would you like to comment on that, please? Sure, thank you, Atuna. I think, you know, maybe I'll give a, since we've been talking thematically, uh, just a case study. Uh, and the case study I can give very quickly is, uh, as a healthcare investor, we have invested in an ophthalmology chain, uh, which is focused on the eyes. And, you know, basically the background to this is, this is an investment which is spanning India and now Middle East. But when we started reading about Indian healthcare and the demographics, we read one third of the world's blind people live in India. So it was just a stunning statistic, 31% of the world's blind people living in India, over a hundred million diabetics. And as you see the demographic effect or the healthcare effect of diabetes, it impacts the eyes, the heart, and you know, just all the body parts. So literally that's where we've taken a large stake, 40% uh, stake in one of India's largest 
ophthalmology providers. And the reason I mentioned this, this is a chain which is built by a couple of uh, very inspiring entrepreneurs, but only focused on the smaller cities of India. And, you know, again, if I go back to what I'd said, the way we look at uh, ESG investing, or at least the building blocks, it's really on our four pillars, access, affordability, quality, and the human capital. And there are business like this, which is ASGI hospitals, the access today, it's in more than uh, uh, 23 smaller cities of India. We're not talking the big cities, tier two, tier three cities. It's impacted over 6 million lives. The quality, again, for a smaller city, people underestimate the readmission rate, the less than 0.5%, very less surgical site infections. The affordability, you know, again, in a smaller city, this is something which uh, now that uh, insurance is kicking in, uh, you know, this is a really a bridge or a, you know, a game changer for people to access. And then probably most importantly, the human capital, uh, almost uh, the female staff or the women uh, uh, staff, we're talking almost 30% of the staff, 20% doctors, over a thousand jobs. So, you know, I'm just using this as an example of where we're doing good. But at the same time, we're looking at this as a pre-IPO investment uh, and something which is attracting international investors, regional investors, and people want to get good returns. But at the same time, this isn't just ESG for doing good sake. It's something which people can genuinely touch and feel on the affordability access, human capital, and uh, uh, quality side. So hopefully that gives an example of where we've been able to mix you know, ESG investing, but with real tangible uh, making a difference on the ground and giving returns. Thank you very much for that, uh, Abhishek. Um, I think a recurring theme um, throughout these discussions has been, of course, human capital, which we've touched on this. Um, uh, it has been mentioned uh, already that there, ha there have been several movements of social unrest um, happening throughout the world. Um, just linking it back to, to ESG, um, uh, why has the S taken center stage? Nisreen, would you like to comment on that? Um, yes, I think, I think you, as you pointed out, um, uh, there has been more of a focus on um, social change and it's really, uh, it, it's really been uh, exacerbated uh, during COVID. You know, we saw more of an emphasis on healthcare, on employment rights, on uh, equality, um, on, I mentioned Black Lives Matters earlier, but also women's rights, all of these. And so uh, that, that is um, uh, coming out in terms of um, investments as well. And we also see, you know, the next generations care more about, increasingly more about this than our generation does even. And you know, they don't wanna work for companies who don't have uh, proper healthcare or who don't care about their employees. And they don't even wanna be associated with them as consumers. So I think that's it. The, the S factor specifically is really uh, becoming much more prominent for, for younger generations as well and for the wealthier uh, generations. Um, we This has really forced um, uh, asset managers, investors, et cetera, uh, to be creative in terms of product innovation. Um, of course, we are investors still, and it's important for us to have returns. But I think the, the, the leaders really leading um, in this area are the ones who are able to provide um, products that factor in not just uh, returns, but also innovation on a social level. So for example, we have at Amundi, Amundi Social Bonds, which is, uh, a, a, it's a fixed income solution to address social inequalities, but equally on the equity side, we have uh, many different funds that focus on climate action, on education, um, and on other areas. This is really um, uh, the link, the S factor, towards other um, uh, factors of ESG, because um, as we've seen, for example, with COVID, and as we're seeing with climate change, it really has an, uh, a much higher impact on the, um, the poorer sections of, of society. So it, it's, it's really all uh, connected. Um, 
climate, you can't look at climate change without looking at the social impact. You can't look at governance without looking at the social impact. So it's really inevitable that this part of ESG is on the rise. From a returns perspective, I, I just, from a returns perspective, I just want to emphasize that we've actually done at Amundi a lot of research on uh, the returns aspects of ESG generally. Um, and our research has shown that it's really becoming, ESG is becoming financially material, that it is a source of outperformance, both on the equity side and the bond side. Um, and that the social pillar specifically has really caught up um, uh, with ESG investors and has caught ESG investors' attention uh, following the, the market stress that I mentioned because of the COVID outbreak. And this has particularly been the case in the US and North America. I think Europe has always been a little bit ahead on ESG and on the social pillar, but we now see that, that the North American markets are also paying attention to it. Thank you. Thank you, Nasreen. Um, that seems to be the, all the time that we have today. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, this was very insightful and we covered a lot today. So um, uh, for those who want to review anything we covered, uh, I believe this session is recorded and uh, you do receive a copy um, shortly um, and you. you can access it on demand. All that's left to say is thank you to our amazing panel and um, for presenting. Thank you all for taking the time to attend today's session.